JamesAllen.com is the online destination to easily design a customized engagement ring and save up to 50% compared to traditional stores. You pick a diamond, whether it's lab-created or earth-created, James Allen has over 200,000 conflict-free stones. Then, you pick your ring setting and metal. And if you need some help, they have real-time diamond consultations available, where an expert can walk you through it all. Get 25% off your order at jamesallen.com code podcast. That's jamesallen.com code podcast. You've discovered your link to GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat Podcast. Now, here's your host, GoPowerCat.com publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to another edition of the PowerCat Insiders Podcast. Tim Fitzgerald, Jay Heidrich, Matt Walters, Ryan Gills, Gilbert, your foursome today on a post-Super Bowl Monday. I am wearing my red, win or lose. That's a that's a parenting lesson right there, Jay Heidrich, right? Yep, okay. you gotta figure out how to uh, move on, even though the team you uh, cheer for uh, didn't win. Especially if you're a nine-year-old boy like my son, who was distraught last night. Yeah, exactly. Matt Walters, throughout the podcast today, when it's your turn to answer a question, I will require you to run like forty yards in circles before you release your answer. You will be Patrick Mahomes in this edition of the Insiders. And this is the PowerCat Insiders podcast sponsored by Blue Mark Energy. Does your company or your employer spend $4,000 or more a year on energy bills? Would you like to reduce those costs by 25% or more and maintain the same level of service and reliability? If so, it's time to speak with Blue Mark Energy. Blue Mark Energy is K-State owned and K-State proud. It wasn't a good weekend if you were a Chiefs and Kansas State fan. I mean, it's kind of a lost weekend. You you saw your teams struggle as K-State basketball has done throughout this season. But let's go fishing for some good news. K-State basketball lost by fewer points than the Kansas City Chiefs did in the Super Bowl. K-State falls to Texas Tech 73-62 on Saturday at Bramlage Coliseum. I find myself measuring progress in the weirdest ways. They lost by less. You know, I, I mean, that's kind of where we're at. It's the reality. It, and I, I don't like the phrase moral victories going both directions. I don't like people claiming them. And I don't think, I don't appreciate people saying anytime you try to find anything positive out of a loss, you're claiming a moral victory. I am in no way doing that. I'm trying to measure some form of progress for a team that is ill-equipped to play at this level. And that is Kansas State. Uh, and neither am I, uh, which is a pet peeve of Jay and mine, trying to reward playing hard because that is like a baseline thing you do in sports you were expected to play hard and compete um and i don't i really cringe every time the play hard charts brought up but matt walters i did see some signs of progress from kansas state on saturday they defended better inside the arc they were dreadful outside the arc they gave up too many free looks from three-point range and tech cashed them in which was a major issue 10 of 20 from three-point range I thought they defended better, and they certainly, in the final maybe 30 minutes of the game, moved the ball much better offensively and created some better shots. It went inside out, um, and uh, they in turn shot the ball better themselves after a sluggish start. I'm grasping here, but I did see signs of progress that I found encouraging. Your thoughts? Uh, it's, that's <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the, the way it is right now. I, I did too. Uh, I listened – to the ball game. Uh, I thought that, you know, Texas Tech did something they don't normally do, and that's hit a boatload of threes. They are not a great three-point shooting team, but Edwards and McCuller both went three for four behind the arc in that ball game. You know, Kansas State uh, did some good things at the defensive end. You know, they, did, they did some good things on the glass. The turnover number, though, is just way too high, and, you know, you're not – you're not going to win a big 12 game taking just 44 shots. And again, that goes back to, you know, what we discussed so many times and it's K-State's warts at the offensive end. And, you know, Texas Tech's a good team. I don't think they're a final four caliber type squad, but um, Chris Beard again has a solid club. And, you know, for, for Kansas State, for Bruce Weber, you know, after getting blitzed down at Allen Fieldhouse, they at least – showed a bit of life and a little bit of tenacity and some gumption at home on Saturday. Jay, your thoughts? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. It's tough because I don't want to be overly negative because there were some positive things that came out of that uh, game on Saturday for sure. I think the Tech's actually a pretty good matchup for K-State because they play similar uh, on both ends. You know, they're both defensive-minded or traditionally defensive-minded teams. Um, I think Tech runs decent offense. They play hard, but I don't think that you, you go into a game against Tech um, – you know, thinking that they're, you're going to get out X and O'd by uh, by Chris Beard. He's a fine coach. I'm just saying that it's it's th- that's not his forte, even though he did it a couple of times. So I think Tech's actually a pretty good matchup for K State. But you know, it's you, you want to acknowledge improvement, um, and improvement was the fact that the effort was there. Um, but at the same time, when you say that, you know, effort is an expectation, not an accomplishment. And so it's you, the hope is that uh, these kids will see that that increased effort will put them in a position to where they can hopefully uh, win some games down the stretch uh, or put themselves in a position to win the games down the stretch. What I saw too Saturday um, beyond the turnovers, uh, we know when you have I think 20 turnovers and 18 made shots that that you just can't beat anybody with that. Or when you're turning it over 30 percent of your possessions. Um, but what I what I saw uh, on 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 Saturday, and I wasn't able to watch it, so I should say what I listened to on Saturday was uh, a young team that hasn't had the benefit of being in any close games yet. Um, several times they cut it with the six or five, and they would have a critical turnover or give up an easy bucket or give up a three pointer. Uh, you know, with two minutes to go, a little over two minutes to go, they cut it to six or five, and then they. Um, Nigel Pack had a turnover, then they gave up an easy bucket, and then um, uh, Mike missed a three-pointer, and then they gave up another bucket, and all of a sudden, you know, it's 10 points again. And so I, I think that's what K-State's really missing is that experience of playing close games and how to, how to pull them out at the end when you need to make a play. Agreed on all of that. Ryan Gilbert, this team has a disturbing trend. They've got a lot of disturbing trends, but again – Tech finishes game, I don't know, hitting their final seven shots or something. It's something we've seen this team do. And it gets back to the fact that uh, this group of cats hasn't learned how to value possessions enough. Everything in the final minutes of a close game, a close-ish game, uh, is magnified. Whether it's turnovers or three-point shots, everything looks more dramatic than it is uh, in the big scope of everything. Uh, it seems like when teams really clamp down in the final minutes offensively and get more precise in how they're performing, K-State's defense doesn't rise to meet that expectation because this was a closer game than 11 points, and yet we see an 11-point loss, and we see too many turnovers, and it's easy then to pause on the bad end of the ledger. Your thoughts overall on this game because I, I thought outside of the early stretch of the contest and the last – you know, I don't know, 10 possessions. I thought K-State was pretty good in the middle. Yeah, K-State, I mean, they were kind of within arm's length the entire game. And like you said, Jay, Texas Tech just made those those huge, you know, they had a couple big threes when K-State was going on those runs. So, you know, a play here, a play there goes differently, and we could be talking about a win for Kansas State. But, you know, make no mistake about it, Texas Tech's a good team. I think Antonio Gordon – It'd be remiss if we didn't mention his efforts and only uh, four points, nine rebounds, but just, you know, hustle plays, making a lot of a lot of those key moments for K-State to stay in that game. So I was impressed with Antonio, you know, played all 40 minutes, but, you know, ultimately K-State just, you know, came up short. And I think that, you know, there's there's losses where you're really frustrated and that was, you know, no progress was made, but this was a good loss and no such thing as a moral victory, but it's a step in the right direction here as we prepare for Texas. I I'm baffled by Antonio Gordon, Matt Walters. It's been a long time since I've felt more conflicted about a Kansas State basketball player than I do Antonio Gordon. Some games I think he's absolutely dreadful, and I wouldn't even want him off the bus. This game he plays 40 minutes, and as Gil said, he only had four points, but he just seemed to be everywhere doing everything. And this is notable for Antonio Gordon, zero turnovers. Um, there. Every time I want to give up on the kid, he does this. You know, it's like there's something there, and I hope Antonio can get it out of himself before uh, he's too far into his junior year next season because his clock is a ticking. But Saturday he was pretty good, and and I think the fact that 
his head coach played him all 40 minutes. Tells you all you need to know what the coaching staff thought of his efforts. Well, he's, he's becoming more consistent on a daily basis and, and doing more in the practice gym. So that's part of it. You know, he has nine boards, blocks a couple of shots, three of the boards or uh, or offensive boards. So, you know, kudos to him. I, I think the big thing for him, again, you know, while he only takes four shots, he wasn't taking a bunch of three-pointers or some, you know, some shots that he has no business taking. You know, while he is a sophomore and maybe – remains a little bit behind, you know, Coach Weber will allude to it every so often that uh, there was there was some time that Antonio missed, um, you know, not just from COVID, but even going back during the offseason like last summer, you know, he, he wasn't here working out with the troops, um, you know, even though COVID was going on. And, you know, there are some things that I think have kept him behind uh, the eight ball a little bit, but you know, good for him. Uh, you know, he, he plays 40 minutes against Texas Tech, does some good things. Uh, earlier in the week against KU, he plays 22 and a half minutes, scores seven, has eight boards, again, some consistency there with a couple of games last week. And let's see if he continues to, to string things together. I, I think it's understandable why, why your conflicted fits and why some other fans are. He's got it there, you know, physically he's got to get stronger, but, you know, again, understanding the game and, and knowing what you should do between the years is also a big part of it. He's slowly getting there. And Jay, he's got to continue to progress on the defensive end. Um, I'd have to go back and watch the game again to actually comment on how he was defensively in this game. But I think that alone shows that he didn't do anything so glaring that it jumped out at me. And we've, we both had those moments this season when he just kind of, he gets out of the way of the bull charging down the lane. And, um, there, there's something there. Uh, I, I wish he would try to ad- adapt his game to be a little bit like a poor man's Dennis Rodman and the fact he wants to defend and rebound and use his athleticism and his legs are going every which way. And, you know, he's got some of those physical attributes and then just kind of athleticism we saw from the worm in his NBA time. But he's got to be really good on defense if he wants to get there. Yeah, I- Honestly, going back to last week, I'd compare him to a name that came up last week with Tim English. You know, he's a kind of an undersized four that he could, that can stretch people out a little bit. He's not a he's not a great three point shooter as we've seen, but he does have some perimeter skills to um, create some mismatches, and he does have size. He's not a terrible athlete. Um, he's not a but he's not an uber athlete. But he's got some things that um, present can, can make it difficult for the other side. But he's got to get consistent um, in his head. He's got to get consistent on effort. You know, um, I'll give you the, the two games are a perfect example. Again, I couldn't watch Saturday, but it just seemed like his name kept coming up on the radio for every loose ball, for every rebound, block shot there. And, and they just kept saying it over and over again. Compare that with Tuesday against Kansas. You know, he scored more points against KU, um, had, you know, uh, probably a better, you know, stat sheet uh, number against KU. But his effort and his defense against KU was just dreadful. I mean, um, he would just get, and this may seem harsh, but they just they just punked him. I mean, they would just push him out of the way, get a rebound, and um, go up, dunk the ball, or and he would just run out of the way. Someone's coming down down the lane, he steps aside, you know, and, and he just wanted no part of that at all. Um, and I think it sounds like from uh, Coach Weber's post game, they challenged him a little bit after that game. They saw some of those same things. And, uh, and challenge them to be better. And, and that's what they've got to do. I mean, kids got to start challenging themselves. Antonio Gordon has good skills. He has the ability to offer this team uh, things to do. But, but, he, but he can't be just a, a guy that floats around on the perimeter and tries to, uh, um, you know, score some points and, and goes from here and there. You know, he, he's not that skilled. He's, he is not a guy that can just that, – that's going to give you so much on the offensive end that he can be a defensive liability. His game is going to have to be a nose to the grindstone, do a lot of stuff that doesn't show up in the stat sheet. Um, and, and if he does that, he can have a huge impact on games. If he can't, he won't. But but that potential is certainly there, and hopefully he can build on it. Gills, one of the other things that jumped out at me was Selton Miguel is in the back in the starting lineup replacing Dejuan Gordon, who continues to battle that foot injury. But he only played uh, 18 minutes. 
Luke Kasupki came off the bench and played 26 minutes in this game. So I don't know how many games we're into his career, four maybe, uh, since coming back from his foot injury. But the fact he played 26 minutes, had zero turnovers, he only scored five points and took two three-pointers, which is supposed to be his forte, hit one of those. He must be doing things that the coaches like. There, there, there must be something uh, kind of like glue guy type things that, Luke is offering the team right now. And and I think we, we saw the coaches really get into a rotation here. Kasupki and Miguel. And, you know, another topic we'll touch on here in a little bit is Davion Bradford and Casey Iziagu went back to not playing together and kind of rotating for each other. But your thoughts on Kasupki, let's start there. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but Kasupki also hit another three at the, you know, when the shot clock went off. That's right. And they called it back. And so that's kind of going off my point earlier. Antonio Gordon had the same exact thing happen to him. So that could have been six points for K-State as well in that game if they were, you know, get, got those shots off just a moment a moment sooner. But uh, I don't want to pick on Kazubki or anything, but I think I'll pick on the team here. They've got they've got too many role players. Kazubki needs to shoot. He only shot it essentially three times. I think he's going to have to do more than just shoot the basketball like we talked about with Antonio, great hustle plays, great effort, but he's just a role player. We talked about Mike all the time, just a role player. So Kazuki's going to have to step up because K-State's not going to win many games with with these role players on the court. Someone's going to have to step up, and I think Kazuki could be that guy. I mean, who knows how healthy he is? Obviously, he got you know 26 minutes, so something's going well for him. But you know, overall someone's going to have to step up. So I think you bring up a good player to be nominated for that. That's really a, a good point is that, Matt, this is a team full of role players. Even Nigel Pack on a better team is a role player. He's being asked to score more. Um, and he had 16 and he had five of seven. Uh, again, a really efficient performance, uh, although he did have six turnovers, which you never want to see from your point guard. Um yeah, on a good team, Nigel Pack is a role player that's scoring double figures. Uh, but this team is a bunch of role guys and not enough fireworks. They don't have enough boom in their lineup. Uh, and it's hard to overcome that. I don't care how good a coach you are. If you don't have enough guys that can go get things done, you're, you're going to be in trouble. And that's kind of where K-State is right now. Yeah, I think with this team, you know, he's the guy, and, and that's something we've talked about for, for some time now. On on some teams, yeah, maybe he's a backup point guard and likely a backup point guard just because he's a freshman and is on his way to becoming that starting point guard. But here he's thrust into it right away, and, you know, he took almost half of K-State's shots, uh, a little bit under half, obviously, but he and Mike McGurl took half of K-State's 44 shots, and, um, what what that tells you is, you know, again, we talk about Miguel, Gordon, and Bradford combined. Those guys only took 11. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> here's, here's I guess, where I am with this team, and I think we, we all are probably that way, is we know what this team is. We know where its faults are, and there are plenty of them. There are some good things that this team does. Uh, you know, I, I heard the comment after the KU game that, uh, you know, Davion Bradford apologized to, to Bruce Weber that, um, you know, he just, he, he was out of it. He was in Allen Field House and they were playing KU and it was somewhat overwhelming. Well, they didn't have 16-5 in that building. And to me, there's just, there's so many little things with this team and big things for that matter that, it is what it is. Yeah, there's way too many role players. There's not there's not enough dudes right now, uh, and, and that's what we're seeing. And I don't know if any of these guys are going to turn into that. I think that Nigel Pack is going to remain that. He's going to be the guy. It's hard to lead as a freshman, but as of right now, next year, I mean, can you tell me anybody else whose face needs to be on the cover of the media guide? The uh, Nigel Pack, it's got to be him. Yeah, I I literally don't know what you do with the cover of the media guide. You usually put a senior in. Rudy Williams would be the only one, and he only played eight minutes on Saturday, which I thought was too low. I mean, Nigel Pack is your guy. He's right. the one that's taking the shots. He wants to take the shots. Um, you know, it's – I'm not sure K-State's going to be able to win a game. 
the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. You know, their, their skid is at, you know, 10 right now. Uh, hard to imagine that we we're saying that about a K state team, but, um, they, they have to finish strong. We're going to take some positives, I think, out of a, out of some games the rest of the way, but it, the rest of February and into early March is going to be quite difficult. Jay, Matt just brought up something that I found incredibly disturbing, that the K-State players admitted that uh, they were um, overwhelmed going into Allen Fieldhouse, and there were hardly any fans there. Look, there, you only have four guys on your roster who have played in Allen Fieldhouse, and uh, three of them only once. And I don't think Mike McGurl is sitting around the locker room saying, oh, it's it's incredible. You guys are just going to be overwhelmed. I don't think that's being communicated. What concerns me is there's something cultural within the program to fear this building instead of feeling like you can go in there and win, which is honestly something they have about, you know, Oklahoma's – Home court, they've gone into other places and won consistently. They seem to be culturally scared of Allen Fieldhouse. And honestly, I'll be blunt, it pisses me off. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's that's kind of a non issue for me. I mean, everyone talks about how K State doesn't have success in Allen Fieldhouse. Well, nobody has success in Allen Fieldhouse. Um, I mean, th this year, Oklahoma State uh, has pulled, you know, had, had a great game there and, and, uh, and, and put the hammer down on KU and Allen Fieldhouse. But, I mean, no one ever wins in Allen I think Bill Self has more Big 12 titles than he does losses in Allen Fieldhouse. Um, and so, yeah, it's there's a lot of things that go into that. There's there's the mindset. The It's a difficult place to play. It's also, um, you know, unless you're there every day like KU is, it, it's a tough gym to shoot in. Uh, when you just come in and, and, and you don't play in a, in a big field house like that all the time. Um, you know, it's uh, it, there, there are a lot of things that, that are different about about KU and, and Allen Fieldhouse and the mindset and the culture. And so when, when everyone gets upset about us losing in Allen Fieldhouse, that, that really doesn't bother me because everyone loses there. Um, it's, I'm more um, interested in how we play. Uh, at, at Allen Fieldhouse, if you go in and you lose, that's one thing. If you go in and and you play and you give yourself a shot to win, um, you know we, we've done that. You know, Dean Dean Wade had a shot at the buzzer to um, uh, um, try and and uh, tie the game a few years ago. So we we were right there uh, a few years ago, and, and that that happens to everybody. But how, how do you play with it? And, you know, you, you, you go back to, you know, what do you got? You do right now you do have a bunch of role players on this roster. And, but I think one thing to remember is that Nigel Pack would be a role player, but he'd be a role player because of his age, not his ability. Right. Um, and, and, and there's, a, there's some other people that are, that are similar and fit into that as well, but they're just, they're just not experienced enough to, uh, to have those expectations and, and, and to be able to, to, to live up to them. Gills, are you scared of Allen Fieldhouse? You're a Johnson County guy. I, you know, I mean, you probably had a lot of fans that worship that place. Uh huh. With the full, with the full capacity, yeah, I understand <laughs> that for sure. But I don't understand how, you know, it's just once you get you know in between the black lines, it's basketball. Nothing changes, right? So. I don't understand. I don't understand Bradford on that. I'm, I'm with you, Fitz. I kind of agree. When we come back, we're going to talk about my new hero on the K-State basketball program, Casey Iziagu, and his ability to drop the word shit so perfectly throughout a post-game press conference. If you haven't heard it, go to our YouTube page for Go Power Cat and check it out. We also have it linked at the front page of Go Power Cat. It is priceless because it was so casual and so perfect. We'll be back with the PowerCat Insiders Podcast. The PowerCat Podcast will be right back. Getting the crew together isn't as easy as it used to be. We get it. Life comes at you fast. But trust us, your pals are desperate for a good hang. And when they hear you stock the party with drinks from Drizzly, they'll be banging down your door. Let Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery, take care of the supplies. All you need is an excuse. It doesn't even have to be a good one. It's your dog's birthday. The loquats are finally ripe. Whatever. With Drizzly, you can compare prices on a massive selection of beer, wine, and spirits and get them delivered straight to your door, which means you can entice the crew to leave their houses without ever leaving yours. 
whatever the occasion. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. Is your January looking dry? Get some lotion, get a humidifier, and better yet, get Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. With Drizzly, you can compare prices across local stores to get the best price on a huge selection of drinks perfect for dry January. Every single time. Non-alcoholic wines? Have a look. Ready-made mocktails? Grab a straw and order them up. Beer without the alcohol? (laughs) Yep, take your pick. You can find all of them here, in the app, in that phone that's in your hand. Could it be any simpler? Nope, not a chance. So shop for great deals on all your dry January beverages or other drinks and get them delivered to your door or blanket fort, maybe. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. And don't forget to lotion up your elbows. They're looking a little dry. We now send it back to the PowerCat Podcast. Welcome back to the PowerCat Insiders Podcast. We are brought to you by Blue Mark Energy. Blue Mark Energy is a natural gas products and services provider serving feed yards, hospitals, hotels, manufacturers, and school districts throughout the Midwest. And Blue Mark Energy is the natural gas provider for the Kansas State campuses in Manhattan and Salina. Blue Mark Energy, K-State owned and K-State proud. Tim Fitzgerald. Matt Walters, Jay Heidrich, and Ryan Gilbert. What has become your normal foursome, if you want to say we're normal, for basketball season? Uh, A few other topics before we move on to Casey Easy Agu, as I am corrected by Matt Walters in the break. Um, He's still my hero, no matter how you say his last name. I'm just impressed I got that close. Uh, K-State was 9 of 20 from three-point range, which is by all measurements, an outlier this season for Kansas State. Now, Jay and Matt, you didn't see the game. You heard it on radio. Ryan Gilbert, did you feel like this was a case of K-State just hitting the same shots they have been taking, or was it a case of the ball was moving differently in this game and there was more rhythm to those shots? Because I'll be honest, I thought the offense for big chunks of this game looked totally different. The ball was moving. It was going inside. It was out. It wasn't sitting in hands for prolonged periods. And with the exception of Mike McGurl having to chuck up some deep three-pointers, difference being he hit some of these, which he normally doesn't hit the deep ones, I thought they were just taking better three-point shots. Yeah, the offense definitely flowed better and had a lot more rhythm to it, and those are going to lead to the makes. So you're definitely right on that. I mean – we saw games earlier in the season where they were just chucking them up, and that's not what we saw for the most part on Saturday. But, Jay, anytime you hit shots, you look better. I mean, it's just the way the basketball game is, whether they're good shots, bad shots. If they go in the basket, the coach looks brilliant. It's the way the game is. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing against Iowa State, first game of the year. You know, you, you're, making, you're making shots, you get out, and you're able to – um, pull out a W in that game. And you know, basketball is an easy game when the ball goes through the hoop. And uh, I think that's been two of the issues for K-State this year. One is they take, as a whole, um, too many three-pointers and don't attack the basket enough. Um, I thought, you know, just from listening to the game again, that they did a better job of that um, on Saturday because they actually, uh, I think, took more free throws than Tech did uh, down the stretch and were able or, – in the game and were able to get to the line where they didn't make as many as they probably could have. And that was a, a, a detriment, but getting to the line is a plus. And, you know, sometimes, you know, if you have an open three in the in the flow of the offense as a division one perimeter guard, you should take that shot. But um, K-State's problem, in addition to taking too many, has been the type of three-pointers they take, you know, coming early in the shot clock, often on ball screen, just pulling up um, and, and not allowing the offense to work and, and forcing the defense to rotate. And so, it, you know, if you're getting better shots, then that, that solves part of the problem. And it sounds like uh, they, they were doing that and, and made some, which kept them in this ballgame. 
Matt, they did shoot 22 free throws. It ended up 22 for both teams. Tech hit 15. K-State did 13. They were miserable. Uh, some of that was Davion Bradford shot eight of those 22 and only hit three. The big guy's got to cash those in. That can't be an ongoing trend. He, he looks like he's capable of hitting free throws, but he needs to get up around 70% if he really wants to be effective. And that was another good sign. It showed that uh, against a really good defensive team that isn't known for reaching and, and fouling a lot, I thought Kansas State really did rotate the ball and, and force Tech into some positions defensively it didn't want to be in. And again, there's a there's a positive sign in the in the course of another loss. In a conference season where K State hasn't been very good no. offensively. So, you know, Texas Tech is one of those teams that's, you know, considered one of the, the you know, top three defensive teams in the Big Twelve. Um, yeah, you've got to hit your free throws. You've got to do the little things, especially when your margin for error is as small as it is for K State. You know, now can they can they do that again this week? Uh, I always I always think it's one thing to do it on the road compared to doing it at home. And you know, you should be able to uh, have a different comfort level. And now when K State goes to you know some of these other road venues here in February, uh, can in case they block out the the cardboard fans and and execute at the offensive end, I mean you've. You, you, I think Kansas State, because of their their offensive challenges, needs to or would be better served just to to, you know, take take the air out of the basketball in some ways. I think K State can excel running. I don't, I'm not saying run the four corners, which you can't do anymore, obviously, but. I think K-State's got to minimize possessions so many times, whether, you know, it's when KU comes here before long, you know, it doesn't matter where K-State goes. They're, they're going to be a team that's got to win in the, the, let's say, 55 to 65 range, and they're not going to have many opportunities if it gets above 65. I think that's the, I think that's the upper end of the, the scoring scale for Kansas State to have a chance in, in any games and they're gonna they're going to have to hit seven, eight, nine threes in some of these upcoming games if they're gonna win. That doesn't mean take thirty or thirty five of them. Uh, I'm much more comfortable with K State shooting twenty threes compared to thirty threes in a game, as long as they're as Jay said, in the course of offense. But um, you know, we'll we'll see. But I you know, again K State was better at the offensive end of the floor against Tech. Uh, Gills, I'll get back to you in a second, but Jay, I want your thoughts on that. Matt thinks his team needs to go at a slow pace, which they have been. 44 shot attempts in a 40-minute game. That's 1.1 per minute of basketball. Um, That is slow, and they were in this game. Is that a formula they need to follow? I think it depends on your opponent. I think Tech forces you to play slow um, because they guard you so well. They don't give up a lot of cheap stuff early in the clock. If you're playing a team like Oklahoma, for example, that's not as known for its effort on the defensive end, you may get some open looks um, early in the, in, in the clock that lead to more possessions in a game than, than Tech will give you. Um, I, I think that that's another reason why Tech is probably a good matchup for K-State in that you're, you're not open as often. I think part of the problem with K-State is that guys are open early in the shot clock and they can't follow that rule of there's a reason why you're open. Um, and just because you, you can, doesn't mean you should. And so when you're playing tech, you know, they, they just smother you and they, and they come at you. And so you don't find yourself as open and having the opportunity to take as many bad shots early in the shot clock, because uh, you're just smothered for, for the whole possession. I think that that works well because it cuts down on um, K State's ability to make bad mistakes. You still got to take care of the ball, but I, you know I think it, it's going to it's going to depend on um, uh, who you're playing. But you know I hate to say that they they should play slow because K State's offense they need easy buckets. They need to get out and push it a little bit and, and try to get some easy buckets and fast break. Um, and so if if you're not efficient on the offensive end, I can't say that. Plus possessions is necessarily good for you because you need more possessions to um, to, to generate more points. Okay, Gills. Casey Easy Agu goes into the post game press conference. He and Nigel Pack were the two guys, two players invited in, 
And uh, this is, I think, the second time we've had him, um, only the second time this season. And um, he was fabulous. All right. First of all, he's got this really endearing, I don't know if it's a speech impediment or what, but um, he's like, he kind of has this gentle giant thing about him that I, I just loved. But he so casually dropped a word that I normally don't use on our podcast, and not because it offends me, but because some people do find it offensive. But uh, it was the perfect use of the word shit. I'll just say that. And I'll, I'll, let me, I'll, in post production, I'll drop it right here so that folks can hear him. It's even a bit tough for all of us. We all gone through a little shit. The fans don't really know it. Um, people still talk down on us or whatever on the internet. They don't know what we're going through, but we still, we still are going to be able to put our number one effort all the time. And our teammates, my teammates, my point guards, all the guards around me, they know that I can still score the ball. I've been going through some. I've been fighting myself, going through my leg injury and all that stuff, but they know, they feel that we can still score down. Me, D, Brad, Antonio feel that we can still score down. So they give us chances, and um, I want to capitalize on all those chances they give us. He really laid it on the line. Um, he, I, I was so in, impressed by how he just laid it out and telling people they've been through a lot, and I did not know this, that his knee was injured going into the season. Um, one of the questions was, how's your knee compared now to the start of the season? And he said, well, I've, I've been doing this blank for the whole year. I mean, and now he's having to do massive amounts of pregame prep just to get his knee functional for the game. He played 17 minutes, 47 seconds, hit four of six field goals, two or three from the line, only had two rebounds. That's got to be better. He had four fouls, so he's following the trend of all K-State big men, and three turnovers. It was far from a perfect game from KC. But I think fans that listen to that entire post-game press conference kind of grasp that he's invested. This is important to him. He's hurt by what's going on. This isn't a kid that looks like he's ready to hit the door of the transfer portal. Um, I, I really don't know what my question is, but your thoughts on how Eziegu handled himself in post-game and uh, what he could mean for this program moving forward. Well, he's just super genuine and honest and, you know, didn't hold anything back. Obviously, after a loss, I'm not going to sit here and point my finger at anyone who's short with the media, but he was, you know, happy to talk and talk about the struggles. But he even said himself that he's been living in the training room and there's no excuses with this season. But, you know, for him to come out here and play like he did, you know, his effort, his effort, he gives the best effort of anyone I've ever seen on a basketball court. And sometimes, it's a little too much where he tries to do too much. I think he had two offensive fouls called on him. So that hurt him there, but you know, take this with a grain of salt. He was the only wildcat, I believe with a positive plus minus. So, you know, his, his presence on the court, I would say definitely made a difference. I believe he had that, uh, was it a lob from Nigel pack on an alley-oop and, you know, just beautiful plays like that, that obviously there's a lot of frustrations with this season, but there's just those plays that it's like, We've talked about with Davion how good he is that you don't really see from K-State big men too often. So mm -hmm. I like what he's doing. I think that K-State made a pretty good, uh, to start the second half especially, put an emphasis on trying to back down on Santos Silva for Texas Tech and really trying to uh, put the ball inside and score there. It didn't work out that well, but I think it says a lot that, that Weber likes Bradford. He likes Easy Agu moving forward. I think that he's, I mean, he's just a great kid and, one of those players that you want. And I, like you said, Fitz, I love the way he talks. It's just something about it, man. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And plus, um, I think I like him because we're both – the word sculpted is used to describe both of us, I think. I, I think that's pretty clear that physically we're – we could be twins. Um, Matt, let's look down the road. It's always challenging this season. You look down the road, no matter what show we're doing, it's like, oh, crap. Look at this. K-State plays host to Texas on Tuesday night. They go to Oklahoma State over the weekend, and they come home and play host to Kansas next Tuesday night. It's just the way it is in this conference. There is no relief, particularly when one of your two games with Iowa State is postponed and, and apparently isn't going to be played. This is just brutal, man. This I don't I, I don't know. what You mentioned it earlier. I don't know where they're going to get a win, but they've got to continue to compete better than they have been, and at least Saturday was a sign of that. Oh. Matt's dead. Jay, um, it's, it's got to be a, a sign of progress every game now. I've got to see something every game. I don't care if it's Texas or Kansas or going to Oklahoma State. You better give me something to grasp here. 
Yeah, it's just that's what, what you wanted to see all season is from a young team that you know they're going to make mistakes, you know they're going to have a difficult time, but can t- can today be better than yesterday? And that that's what you want to see in practice. That's what you, what you want to see in games. Can you can you reduce the mistakes um, that that you made the previous game and give yourself a chance to win? And you know, <clears throat> Nigel Pack had a great game against Texas A and M. Uh, we've talked about that, and he followed it up with two not so great games against KU and against Texas Tech. And uh, against KU, he had a long uh, um, athletic guard on him in Marcus Garrett that uh, pressured him and caused him to do a lot of things that made him uncomfortable. And he faced a similar type of pressure against Tech as well. And so um, you, you, you want to see from a kid like Nigel Pack, can you now come back and learn from that pressure that, that you faced and, and be able to handle it better uh, in upcoming games? Same thing with uh, um, Bradford. You know, can you put yourself in a spot where you can give yourself the ability to get accomplished? I know it got handled in <laughs> We know, and so so we know a guy. Uh, but anyway, so we uh, can, can can you get yourself in a spot to be able to uh, um, get get baskets and, and reduce your mistakes? And you know, from I've said this a couple times, they got to get more out of uh, Selton Miguel. Uh, he he has not um, put a lot of numbers up in the last few games, and if he's going to be a starter, he's going to play the minutes he's going to play. They've got to get more production out of him, both in the the stat sheet and um, in just the intangibles as well. Gelsey's right. He did have six rebounds on Saturday. That was encouraging. Um, but Sultan Miguel's got to be better. He, he's he's yeah. probably been my biggest disappointment. Not that he's been bad. He just hasn't been as good as I thought he would be. And his his ceiling is about as high as anyone on K-State. He is super athletic and Obviously, he needs to work on a lot of those fundamentals like we've talked about here on the podcast. But you're right. He needs to step up and be a lot better. And 17 minutes, I don't know if there's a reason, you know, why he's not getting as many minutes. You know, he started the game, but, uh, you know, maybe in practice needs to show a little bit more and and work a little harder. But I'm with you. Like I talked about earlier, there's too many role players and Miguel can't just be one of those guys. He's going to have to. And Matt's gone again. As <laughs> Matt, when his mic was on, that reminded me of like a Zoom class here where someone's mic is on. The professor's trying to teach, but uh, yeah, you're right. Miguel needs to step up. Poor, poor Matt. He's he's the. <laughs> I'm older than Matt, but he's the old guy with technology. <laughs> his battery died, but I apparently he plugged in his computer, not realizing his Zoom would start back up. So uh, we, we've seen what happens when that takes place during other Zoom calls. Uh, Jay. Oklahoma State, what am I trying to say? They're not that good. I'm not sold on Oklahoma State. I'm not sold on Cade Cunningham. I I think he's going to be a fine NBA player. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I I think he's he's just – He's too casual for most games. You know, I, I just think when he gets to the league, I think he'll be better. Uh, but uh, I, I feel like this is an opportunity for K-State. Going to Stillwater – I feel like it's a team they can match up with. And part of the reason is the guy we were just talking about, Sutton Miguel, who played against Cade Cunningham through his uh, younger career and seemed interested in defending him when they played in Manhattan and did a pretty good job, or Cade Cunningham just didn't care, one of those things. But uh, is it is Saturday a tangible opportunity for Kansas State? Um, yeah, I don't see why not. I, Oklahoma State's certainly been up and down with uh, um, with their season, as you know everybody has uh, throughout the season so far. You know they had a big win against Texas on Saturday, um, so they show that they can that they have some capability to be able to um, pull out big games like that against quality teams. But it, it's and K State did a great job on Cade Cunningham when it, when he came to uh, Manhattan, and you know maybe his motor wasn't running as high as it normally does. But you also got to credit Salt Miguel and the rest of the team on not only holding him to uh, um, I think what four or five points, but like three shots is what is is all he had as well too. So what what we've seen from Oklahoma State is. As talented as Kate Cunningham is, and as many God-given abilities he possesses, 
he's a kid that can go out and beat you by himself. He hasn't demonstrated that, that demonstrated that consistently throughout the year. So, when, but others have proven they can beat you too. This is not just the Cade Cunningham show. They have a lot of quality players on that team who can go out and light you up. And so I think K State's got to go out and, like we just talked about, build on it. What can you do on uh, against Oklahoma State? that um, will give you a win because they've been up and down. They've shown that that they'll give you a chance if, if you can take it. But you've got to be able to go out and, you know, box out. That's another team that's going to play hard. They're uber athletic. They're going to get offensive rebounds. Can you box out? Can you do all the little things to give yourself a chance to win and not beat yourself? Okay, something came out earlier today that I want to talk to both of you about. Uh, Gills, you're from Kansas City, Johnson County. Uh, Jay lives in Kansas City, Light which is Olathe. Um, they announced that the Big 12 tournament can take place in Kansas City. If you haven't been following along, that was even in doubt. Kansas City hadn't given the green light to play the Big 12 tournament. Still no word on any fan attendance or media attendance uh, at this event, which means hotels will be cheap if you just want to go downtown and hang out. I don't know what the rules are for hanging out right now in Kansas City. <sighs> Gills, I, I wish they didn't play this thing. It, it, it doesn't serve a purpose this year other than putting all the teams together. And if someone brings in COVID, the Big 12 may not be represented in the NCAA tournament. I, I'm just really fearful of something happening here. Uh, Baylor shut down again. They can't seem to stay out of COVID issues, um, which is should be terrifying for their national title opportunities. But I wish the conference would just pause and, and go ahead and play some makeup games, get the regular season done, and move on. But we know what this is about. This is about TV money. It's what the whole season's been about. Get in that tournament so that the ESPN contract kicks in and they have to pay for the tournament. But uh, it's going to be a meaningless tournament fraught with um, opportunities for teams to get shut down as they head into the NCAA tournament. I, I, I don't know why they're even persisting at this point. Real quick, I can't believe neither of you mentioned that, that Cade Cunningham got outscored by Joe Petrakis in Manhattan, but that's a different story. Well, that's I think that's the stuff of legend, and that's above yeah. this podcast. <laughs> um, but, you know, Fitz, what if K-Stick goes and wins four games and they get a, a ticket to March Madness? Okay, I'm, <laughs> um, Jay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute Gills now from, from that, for, <laughs> in fact, forever. Mr. Mr. Optimism, but you know, I, it doesn't make much sense in a season like this other than, you know, money. I think K-State could get a win over Iowa State, but they probably wouldn't be playing them. They'd be in the 8-9 matchup, so you know, you're playing TC or Oklahoma State, so it doesn't make much sense. It, it really doesn't. Like, can you imagine if Baylor goes in, because the NCAA, is it March Madness is the next week, right? There's no, there's no like two-week, you know, quarantine break or anything before March Madness, right? I'm not even sure. So I, I, I don't think there is. So yeah. I can't imagine. I cannot imagine that it's a good idea, but it's all about money, like you said, at the end of the day. Jay? I see both of it. Yeah. I, oh, I, it. It's a hard call. I think the, the biggest issue is just controlling your players for a week. And, and honestly, it might be easier to control your players for a week in Kansas City than it is at, at home in, uh, if in Waco or um, Lubbock or wherever you're coming from and put them in a hotel room and lock it down and, and see what you can do. Um, I'll be really interested to see what they do with fans and Power and & Light. I know some of those um, businesses of Power & Light, you know, 40% of their revenue comes from Big 12 week. You know, and maybe not forty percent, but a huge chunk of it comes from Big Twelve Week, and um, I I don't foresee that we'll see the full uh, power and light like we have in the past. Kansas City still has some pretty tight restrictions on um, what time, what times, and how many people and things like that you can you can go. Whether or not those will be enforced, I think is um, a different story. But I think it's fairly safe to say that we're not going to see the living room power and light completely filled up with people like we have in years past. So it's definitely going to be a um, mirrored approach. I don't know what the conference will do with uh, with attendance on that. It wouldn't shock me to see uh, no attendance, um, largely for the reasons that you just mentioned, Fitz, that you want to minimize um, exposure. But, you know, we'll, we'll see I, I, if there's a way to play it. I hope they can play it because I think as we return – uh, and, and hopefully are not, I mean, knock on wood that we're turning the corner on COVID and the pandemic that we 
do get back and to see some um, normalcy. And the Big 12 is fun. I mean, as a player, I still have my office, um, uh, a shadow box that has all the pins that um, for the Big 12 day to day, because as a player, for your admission to the tournament, um, I'm sure they still do it. You get a pin. It's not a it's not a, um, a paper pass like press or somebody might get, but you get a pin. And it's a different pin for each day, and so I have my pins for my senior year, and uh, those are just cool things to experience. You know, you get to go play in an NBA arena, and uh, these kids have sacrificed so much for the year that if if you can play games and in, in in conference and travel and go places, then you 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 can come to Kansas city for a week and, and play the tournament and do it safely. I, I think you can do it. And I hope that they get, get the chance to do that. I think if I was a big 12, I, I, I might rent an entire hotel um, away from power and light and give each team a floor and, and try to keep them away from things. I don't know. I'm just baffled by everything. And I, I gotta, I gotta say this guys. I, I think the NCAA tournament is going to be chaotic. Yeah, there's no way teams don't go through this without getting COVID and possibly one site spreading it. You know, what happens if you wipe out a regional? This is going to be really fascinating to see how the NCAA handles it. And Did, uh, didn't and, they announce that the entire NCAA tournament is going to be in Indianapolis? Yeah, but they'll still have like, you know, you'll be at the Butler gym for this regional or whatever. So, I mean, what happens if the entire Midwest bracket starts getting COVID or, you know, whatever it's a, I, I don't even know. I, I, I'm just – I'm impressed we've gotten this far. I'm impressed we got in an NFL and college seasons. Um, and uh, I think for the most part, probably outside of Baylor, uh, the conference has done a really good job. It, it's so weird to me. Baylor, of all schools, the one with the most to lose this season with COVID seems to be the most reckless. And they've had, what, three games now postponed here uh, coming up because of COVID issues. It's crazy. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. I, I kind of, the times I wish K-State would get wiped out right now with, with too many cases or something. I hate to wish COVID well, upon anyone. We'll have to, well, that, that's something to look into, Gills, that you mentioned, because it wouldn't shock me if there is some type of uh, dead period between Big 12 and NCAA tournament, because my guess is they want people to sit and isolate before they test, before they come to Indianapolis, or they'll come to Indianapolis and then sit, and then and then test before the game starts. So it wouldn't shock me if there is some type of uh, you know, five day period um, to force everyone to, to sit around and, and isolate before before they test them and then uh, move on with the tournament. Selection Sunday is March fourteenth. The first four is March eighteenth. Um, so I don't know how that matches up with um, the schedule. You'd think I'd be better prepared and know this stuff, but I mean, bluntly put, I haven't paid any attention to the NCAA tournament as someone who covers Kansas State. Um, nope. I mean, uh, it's just the same. It's March 13th is the championship of the Big 12, and then March 14th is Selection Sunday, and the first four, sorry, Dayton, will be in somewhere in Indianapolis or Indiana um, a few days later. Um, the, what has changed is the days of the games. The first round this year is on Friday and Saturday. Second rounds on Sunday and Monday. I'm sorry if you booked your trip to Vegas for the wrong dates. Um, Sweet 16 is Saturday, Sunday, followed by Monday, Tuesday, Elite Eight. And then the Final Four is Saturday and Monday like usual. So it'll be a little bit different. But that doesn't affect Kansas State. Unless Gills is right and they make making a miraculous run in the Big 12 tournament. And yep. on that note, we're, we're, we're going to finish this thing. Matt Walters is somewhere off being old, trying to figure out how to use technology. Uh, his battery died during the second half. I'm, I'm sorry for all of you that just listened for Matt Walters. Okay, I know that's no one. But uh, he will be back with us next week. Hopefully we'll have some good basketball to talk about next week on the Powercat Insiders podcast. We appreciate you coming along for the ride here. Jay Heidrich, Ryan Gilbert, I'm Fitz, and we will talk to you real soon. Powercat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street Publishing. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked, temperature set, lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class-leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details.